I'm now going to introduce the moderator of our next panel, Tom Sanzillo, who's the Director of Finance for the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Tom has more than 30 years of experience in public and private finance, author of studies on coal plants, rate impacts, credit analyses, a whole host of, of studies and resources that are frequently quoted by the media that lead him to testify regularly as an expert witness and to teach energy, energy industry finance in a, a host of, of settings. He has 17 years of experience with the city and the state of New York in various senior financial and policy management positions, former first deputy controller for the state of New York where he held oversight over a $156 billion pension fund and a $200 billion municipal bond program. Tom, welcome and thanks so much. Well, trying to be a little time conscious here, so could the uh, panelists for our second panel start coming up um, while I uh, try to introduce um, the panel? And um, we're going to try to do this a little bit um, uh, shorter because of time. Um, I, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank the um, the uh, the um, organizers who invi who invited me. And I owe um, a huge debt to, um, to uh, Clara and to Zipporah. And there are two other women in the audience tonight who um, make our organization work, Kathy Hippel and Vivian Heston, who are, who, you know, who are our lifeblood. You know? I just sort of come up and do these things. Um, I met Fletcher about 10 years ago. And, um, and I remember doing the first panel, I was asked to speak to him. He's running something. He said a bunch of reverends are organizing around divestment. And I said, that's great. You know, I don't know what they would want to do with me. Um, so I think Fletcher was a little nervous. And I said to him, well, you know, I do money. And he says, and he says, okay, well, you know, we, you know, we're, you know, we do, you know, we're a religious group. We do moral uh, uh, stuff. I said, well, that's a good thing because you don't want. Me. I've been in money for 30 years. I said, you don't want me as your moral messenger. Um, but you, but, uh, but, um, so he, we've been friends for about 10 years. He keeps me around, as does the movement, despite my defects. Um, and, uh, and I'm proud to be part of it. Um, today's um, uh, this 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 session is really about something that the movement has, the movement has performed various miracles. Um, and one of the miracles it has performed is it has basically exploded the concept of risk in the in investment world. Um, and it's done that. And you're going to hear from various people who have been the leaders in, uh, in, in making that happen. Um, as an investor, um, a risk is something that you manage. And climate change is not something that is manageable according to the normal dictates of the financial world. Um, and, um, and so we're going to hear from, from people who look at the scientific view of, of what climate means in terms of risk, the, the uh, carbon analysis of, of uh, what's um, um, going on with risk, some of the carbon disclosure issues that companies are faced with, um, some of the um, legal challenges that are being brought um, as companies offend on, um, on the climate, and then um, how our movement is articulating that risk at large, and then we'll have um, um, some questions and answers. I'm not going to ask him any questions, so at the end of the uh, presentations, what I'd like to do is have people line up, and, they can, and we'll just ask questions from the floor. Um, so anyway, let me introduce our panelists. I'm sorry to did say I was going to do this a little bit differently, but um, uh, Kathy Mulvey will be first. Um, is, gonna, is from the Union of um, Concerned Scientists. Um, if any of you don't know the Union of Concerned Scientists, you should. Um, um, Heinrich uh, uh, Jepson from the um, Carbon Tracker Institute. Um, we work um, all over the world um, together, and uh, and we uh, consider ourselves um, allies in this fight. Lindsay Ross, who I've not met, but hi, um, from 427. Um, and then Lisa Hamilton, who I think since I started in the climate movement, I've worked with Lisa in one capacity or another. That's about 12 or some odd years. 
Um, and then, and then uh, I saw May Bove, and it says CEO of 350.org. I consider her Field Marshal Bove um, for the work that she's been doing. And so, without, fur without further ado, um, I think we'll have Kathy start. Um, Great. And, uh, thanks a lot, Tom, and thanks everyone for turning out. So, uh, my my focus with the Union of Concerned Scientists is on the major fossil fuel producers and increasingly under pressure from investors, from litigation, from the public mobilization, um, these companies are starting to make some of, some of the right noises around climate change. And uh, in this context, we really judge that it's, there's an urgent need for guidance informed by the physical and social sciences, in particular for investors, to interpret the climate-related risks that these companies face. And so, it, you know, to the extent that these, that major oil and gas companies have started to publish climate risk reports, they tend to focus on what risk stronger climate policies pose to the company rather than acknowledging the risk that the company's business model poses to the climate and the systemic risk. And um, so the, the uh, so what, I mean, and one interesting thing is that these companies actually in their own, in looking at physical risk have, uh, have in their financial disclosures really not begun to meet emerging mainstream expectations, as we heard a bit from Elliot Harris uh, about, about what's out there in the, in the investor world. And uh, most of them, you know, will, may refer to weather events or increased, uh, you know, possibility of, of storms uh, without making a, a connection to the climate change that's actually brought on by their own projects. And yet some of these same major oil and gas companies have um, hardened their own assets in preparation for these climate impacts. So if you look at, for example, Shell's planning for North Sea to elevate North Sea oil platforms or uh, pipeline projects in, in Europe and Nova Scotia, um, you know, the, the oil and gas companies clearly uh, are aware, and we know that they've actually been aware for, for five decades of, uh, of climate change and the impacts. Um, so. Uh, so companies are starting to pay lip service to the Paris Agreement while betting that the world won't achieve its goal of keeping global temperature increase well below two degrees and striving to limit it to one and a half degrees. And, and one example of that is actually the ExxonMobil Energy Outlook, which the 2019 version just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. And if there's a graph in there that, that shows emissions from the energy sector just continuing to rise until 2040 with no date at which they start to drop and, um, and no point at which they reach net zero as would be required by the Paris Agreement. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in a situation where, where no major oil and gas company has laid out a business plan that's consistent with the science of meeting the Paris target. And um, that would be, it's, it's actually quite simple, net, reaching net zero emissions from operations and from the use of their products by mid-century and conducting all of their actions consistent with that goal. So both the, so a, 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 a socio-political aspect to that as well. And, and what we've actually been working is, is building on uh, some principles that have come out from the Oxford Martin School and seeking to define um, from a scientific perspective some of what I think both uh, Clara, Clara and Daniel referred to um, in, the, in the first panel, um, what, what, this, what scientific guidance for investors would look like. So, um, you know, we need to start seeing viable and verifiable mid medium ter term targets toward that net zero. Um, emission, net zero emissions goal and, and investments and technology pathway portfolios that, that line up with that. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I'm sure Henrik will speak more to the importance of holding these companies responsible for uh, emissions from the use of their products uh, and not just operational emissions, which is 
you know, what, what we've seen as, as these companies have actually begun to um, make commitments to reduce emissions, it's been by and large operational emissions and it really tinkers around the edges of the climate problem. So, you know, looking at what Chevron has, has pledged to do in terms of reducing uh, methane emissions, it is it less, it, it's, it's intensity targets only and it would amount to less than, well under 1% of, of the company's emissions. So, uh, so really, you know, there, there are, the, the, the carbon budget dictates, um, in terms of physical science, what, what these companies ought to be doing. Um, in terms of social sciences, there's also some questions of socio-political implementation, and there's really a, a governance risk for these companies of uh, both continuing to be, to disinform the public about climate science and of um, actually not aligning their political actions with their statements. So paying organizations like the American Petroleum Institute, the National Association of Manufacturers, the US Chamber of Commerce to lobby against what they, positions that they claim to support. And a, a classic example of this in the past year, of course, was BP bankrolling a, a thir to the tune of $13 million, a, a campaign in Washington state to oppose a carbon fee initiative when this company has for a long time said that it supports a, a price on carbon. Um, so the, so I guess a few conclusions that, that come from this are um, that investors really need to be expecting more from the fossil fuel companies. They need to, to question more um, and, and really you know, tolerate less in terms of what, uh, what these companies are, are claiming to do. And, and that means putting the burden of proof on these companies to dispel the skepticism about their, uh, about their statements and commitments. And um, to pick up on the, on the point of, of public policy action, in the US, we have an opportunity with the Climate Risk Disclosure Act to actually strengthen requirements for these companies' disclosures to the Securities and Exchange Commission that would allow greater transparency and consistency. So, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Cassie. And um, uh, my name is Henrik Everson, and I'm the head of investor outreach for Carbon Track Initiative. For those who no, don't, don't already know us, we are a financial think tank based in London. We focus on carbon asset risk, uh, initiated back in 2010-11, where we uh, developed the unburnable carbon thesis uh, that we have taken further into stranded assets, uh, basically with a popular headline of, we can't burn them all. Uh, I saw Bill McKibben somewhere, he was very generous to, to write a, a good article uh, about this work, which uh, a lot of you have used in the uh, divestment movement. Uh, we are a financial think tank, we're focusing on, on analytics. Uh, any good investment decision needs analytics, and that's what we produce, uh, which is being used in a, a lot of different areas. Uh, we're focusing on the supply side of oil, gas, and coal extraction, because that's really where the problem is. Not it doesn't really matter if it's in airplanes or in cars or in some other places. If you can focus and reduce the emissions at the source, then uh, we have a much better way of uh, working with the overall problem. So that's, that's why we have worked on the supply side of emissions. Um, a new area we're also focusing on uh, as a think tank is the technology disruption. We're seeing from, our, from uh, wind, solar, battery storage, etc. So if our first original uh, popular headline was we can't burn them all, we are now also saying we won't burn them all. And all of these decisions are something that is very important for investors to incorporate into their uh, investment analysis. Um, we put out a report, uh, so we basically you can see investment is actually can be very complicated but it can also be very simple. Uh, the warmer it gets, um, the past way we go forward, the more you have to focus on your physical risk. Uh, but the more we want to contain the uh, global warming, the more transition risk you have to focus on. And that's really the, this, the latter arm is what we are focusing on. How are the companies uh, facing and how are they operating in this uh, environment? Uh, we've done a lot on the oil and gas upstream and on power utilities. 
uh, in um, it basically to see how are these companies aligned with Paris Agreement. That's a lot of greenwashing talk about um, what companies are doing and not doing. Uh, and that, that's what we are trying to provide our view on, with providing facts, data, analytics, to come in and say what is right, what is wrong. And um, we put out our uh, third annual uh, oil and gas company upstream analysis called now called Breaking the Habit uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, here we're also looking at more at the shorter term, what are companies actually doing? Are they aligned with the Paris Agreement and the targets uh, put, put out in here and the ambitions? And uh, basically what we have said, uh, we, have a, we don't have time to go into it here, but basically we do scenario analysis to say what projects uh, in the future are aligned or unaligned with a Paris pathway. Any company that is uh, sanctioning or starting projects that is unaligned with the Paris Agreement, I think it's hard to argue that they can claim that they are aligned with the Paris Agreement. Uh, spoiler alert for, for those who have not read, yet read your analysis. This one here, it's available on our website, carbontracker.org. Um, all the big oil majors have sanctioned projects last year or this year uh, that is unaligned with the Paris Agreement. That's a problem. Basically, they have, paid, they have invested more than $50 billion in projects, so you can say that they're betting against the, uh, the, um, the Paris Agreement. So what does that really mean for, for investors and for, for other people is we need to focus on what the companies are saying, what they're doing, and then call them out when they're doing something wrong. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about intensity targets and, and so on. Our view is really you, you can't really have any transition unless we are cutting down and limiting the absolute number of emissions. Uh, if we don't do that, then it's hard to argue we can come out uh, and, and beat any of, any of these things. Shell, when they come out and say we have an intensity target, they can meet that tomorrow. They just go out and buy some solar farms. So um, that's not really changing anything. So this is where analytics is very, uh, very, very useful. But that put a big burden and uh, responsibility on investors. And I'll, I'll uh, end up here saying that uh, earlier today we had, uh, uh, so it's been a busy week with Climate Week. We have one of our analysts in town. We've been around with this, with this report here. And one of the, uh, one of the large uh, institutional investors here in town, uh, the oil and gas team we met with, and they were basically saying, well, but isn't it so that the U.S. carbon emissions have gone down? They're actually at the same level as they were in 86. Uh, what, have, what have we done in that period? We built, has had not really been any government intervention, but we have switched from, gas, from coal to gas. So isn't that just a, the path forward? So it's not only got companies that need uh, an update on the, their financial and uh, finance and investing uh, education. It's also the investors to actually to do something correctly here. I'll stop here. Hi, everyone. Um, I have to say I'm very excited to be in this awesome venue. I've been in really boring New York office buildings all week for Climate Week, so this is really cool. Um, uh, my name is Lindsay Ross. I'm a senior analyst and economist with 427. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of 427, we are the leading provider of physical climate risk data and analysis for financial markets. So we take really complex climate models and distill it down into financial terms for financial analysts to understand, for investors to understand, um, for individual corporates to understand. Um, so because this panel is on, uh, oh, and I also wanted to mention that we recently got a majority share investment from Moody's. So this is a huge signal to financial markets that they're going to start considering uh, physical climate risks as a material risk to companies. So, uh, yeah, we're excited. <laughs> um, because this panel is on fiduciary duty, I wanted to tie in how physical risk um, is a material financial risk to companies because that's really our bread and butter. Um, physical risks obviously can have huge impacts on corporates um, because this is a California sponsored event. Uh, PG&E is a really good obvious example of how climate change is affecting companies and can cause bankruptcies of otherwise um, well, well performing financial companies. So. Um, and by the way, I learned this week in uh, a New York uh, NYU panel that 
uh, the wildland urban interface is actually larger on the eastern seaboard than in California. So that's a huge risk. Um, and we can see that um, the underlying assumptions about risk don't hold true anymore. Um, we have to change the paradigm of how we think about this. Um, so how all this relates to fiduciary duty is it's a progression. Um, right now we're in a world of voluntary disclosure. So Elliot Harris mentioned the uh, task force on climate-related financial disclosures, which was a huge move to get uh, companies to start to disclose their risk, not only in a transition sense, but also for physical, uh, the physical risks to their assets and facilities. Um, we're in a space now where we're learning best practices on how to disclose this risk, so that's where we do, um, we play a lot in that space of what are the metrics that are relevant uh, for companies to disclose around physical risk. Um, then uh, the next part of that is uh, data on the materiality of past weather events. So that builds the case for the materiality of future events. So again, the pg and &E example, hugely material. Um, right now, regulators are watching and learning, and then they're going to weigh in. So uh, we have the network for, the, for greening the financial system, which is a group of 42 central banks and eight observers that are looking at disclosures and what are best practices there. And the Bank of England and Banque de France have also made major announcements about um, the potential to require uh, publicly traded companies in their countries to disclose. In France, actually, they already have to do that. So um, I'll leave it there for now and uh, leave the rest for this discussion. Um, so my name is Lisa Ann Hamilton, and I uh, I'm an attorney and climate advocate, and my task here today is to talk a little bit about litigation, climate litigation, and how it fosters and feeds into this story about fiduciary duty. And I think probably the best way in the time available is to talk about climate litigation as symptomatic of industries that have changed, that no longer have the social license that they once had, that are now subject to billions of dollars of claims that they are facing. And so I want to break this little brief um, overview into three parts. So first, um, as Lindsay touched upon, litigation is a part of the material evidence of material climate-related financial risk. It's among the physical risks, the transition risks, and technology risks. So that, again, I, you know, Tom mentioned that I've been uh, working on climate change for quite some time, and I think it's been interesting to watch just in the last 10 years or so the evolution of how you talk about climate change. It used to be focused exclusively on carbon footprints, this idea of this abstract possible threat many years down the road, and this real change now of talking about specific measurable financial risk associated with climate change and this real push and effort to understand the ways in which there is um, not in 2100, but in, it's hard to believe that in less than three months we will be in 2020 and that it is only a few months away and that the real change that needs to happen needs to happen immediately. So when we talk about litigation risk, we're talking about the increased need for accountability for loss and damages associated with climate change. And the number of cases has risen tremendously. You're going to see more cases brought by municipalities that are impacted, that are facing the very severe weather events, whether they're see seeing sea level rise, increased flooding. Um, and there's this mythology even in the United States that these are primarily coastal communities that are um, suffering from these kinds of damages. But you're seeing all the cities along the Mississippi River subject to flooding. You're seeing areas in highly forested um, areas subject to drought. And so this broadening of an understanding of where this risk is, where it's happening, and the ways in which the, those cities, those municipalities, are seeking damages, and they're seeking for them from the largest um, contributors to climate change, the carbon majors. So you're seeing the municipalities bring cases. There are now over two dozen cases that are currently in the courts 
Some of them have been dismissed, but they're under appeal. But I think their biggest value is not so much the billions of dollars of claims that are coming forth, but the way in which fossil fuel companies are on alert, that it's no longer business as usual, that the costs of now bringing in counsel, having to defend these cases, um, is changing the way that they do business. And that makes for a very different profile if you are a shareholder. Um, there are also questions now about um, the ways in which shareholder litigation is emerging. Um, I think Ramirez v. Exxon is a very good example of a way in which an investor that was deeply concerned about the way uh, regulators were beginning to investigate Exxon and this discovery that there were two sets of books. And for fiduciaries, this brings real concern about traditional Martin portfolio theory as being sufficient for the pricing of assets. This idea that the market will somehow fairly value an asset is mistaken when fraud is a very real part of the fossil fuel company's profile. And so I, I do believe that we will continue to see more shareholder litigation cases. I'm gonna fast forward here a little bit to keep, us, keep me honest on time. I think the biggest important piece of this, we, and Elliot Harris, you're so eloquent, it's hard to follow in terms of fiduciary duty and the way in which fiduciary duty is still being used as a way to defend against divestment. And in the United States in particular, we are laggards. The law does not, is not consistent with that discovery. And I think probably most compelling is a Supreme Court case called Tibble v. Edison International, where they have explicitly said uh, for every fiduciary as part of their duty of care and duty of loyalty has a duty to monitor portfolios to ensure that that investment strategy is consistent and has uh, sustained the way in which the asset is intended to perform to serve the best interests of both current and future beneficiaries. And the reality of it is the fossil fuel company's investment profile has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. And every fiduciary has a duty then to remove non-performing assets if those assets are not performing. And that's, <laughs> that's not the campaigner me, that's the Supreme Court coming down and it's saying what the fiduciary duty is. So all of this is to say in conclusion is that um, in New York, if you are a beneficiary, you have had wonderful fiduciaries who recognize uh, fossil fuel assets as a material risk to your future, the future of your families and the ability to enjoy the pensions that you've worked so hard for. If you are visiting and you are from another community where your fiduciary has not stood up and said we will divest, it's time they need to hear from you because your, your, your pensions, your benefits need you to advocate for those investment strategies that are aligned with what the future holds. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Clara and Janet and Fletcher for this great event. and. When people ask about, you know, how do you stay hopeful about the climate crisis? The fact that there are this many people in a panel about fiduciary duty at nine o'clock on a Thursday night, you know, that's reason to be hopeful about our chances. So thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. For us at 350, a lot of how we think about fiduciary duty is slamming asset owners to recognize that planetary and humanitarian collapse due to climate change is actually worthy of consideration when they think about fiduciary duty. So that's, that's a big part of how we think about it. Um, I want to I engage more deeply, though, on this question of risk and look at it from the other angle, which is what the fossil fuel divestment movement has tried to do, which is to create the perception of risk for not divesting. And you know, we try to keep it simple in that regard, and I remember some advice we got from you, Tom, very, very early on in a meeting in Vermont, where you said, look, it's not the role of necessarily all of the organizers and the students who are pressuring their boards of trustees to divest to walk through the precise aspects of their fiduciary duty. Your job is to be the moral call to action about whether it is right or wrong to make money from climate change. And so that has been the work that 
I think has helped propel the momentum of the divestment movement. And so in the spirit of trying to keep it simple, three points. The first one on risk. The political risk that you face for not doing this. I loved what Scott Stringer said about how he was, you know, worn down by activists who showed up at every single event with a bullhorn. And time and time again, this is the story that we hear from people who have not wanted to make this move and eventually do it, and some of it is just the relentless pressure of organizers and campaigners. And it is a risk to politicians to not pay attention to their constituents. And as the calls for divestment get louder, they have to take that risk into account. Number two, the risk of shame for being on the wrong side of history when it comes to the climate crisis. And there's no better example of this than what young people are doing in the streets right now in New Zealand. You can see on Twitter the climate strike in Wellington happening while we're all here. And of course, four million people last Friday. And the way that young people in particular are breaking through what we have managed to make a very technical bureaucratic conversation about ambition, and nationally determined contributions and add to the list, they have cut through and reminded everyone who's a decision maker on this issue exactly what is at stake and cut through, I think, a lot of emotion. And the, so the, the real risk that politicians aren't paying attention, fiduciaries are not paying attention, and they're having to change their behavior. And finally, and this was touched on already, the, the broader issue of social license and how do we prop up this whole industry that is causing the climate crisis and the banks that back up those same fossil fuel companies. And for us, the arguments that have been made and the brilliant work of Carbon Tracker and others to point out the real stranded asset risk is a piece of it, but the way we think we win and have ultimate leverage is whether the public consents to continue to buy this product, oil, coal, and gas. And increasingly, the answer to that is no. So that risk of losing the public support as an entire sector of the economy is something that we think people should be worried about. And the last thing I want to say, and this is obvious, we've said it many times tonight, but it bears repeating, it is working. It is totally working, and the divestment movement has a fire unto itself, and it continues to grow and grow, and it's put new narratives into the climate movement, it's given a lot of hope to a lot of people, and it feels like it's just going to keep on moving, and the next phase of this, as many of you know, is looking at all of the different actors in the financial system who also bear responsibility. And I was really glad to see these fossil banks, no thanks, pins. Thank you, BankTrack, for putting these on the tables. Um, there's a huge appetite for where this campaign goes next and where some of this energy goes next. And for those who've already divested, well, time to, time to get a new bank. So we're excited about that. Thanks. If there's questions and people want to line up, feel free. Um, I think there'll be, I think there'll be a few. Okay. Oh, we could, yeah. All right, we have time for a few questions. Um, um, go ahead. Hey, hi, I'm Nancy Romer. I work with Divest New York and People's Climate Movement and my union, Professional Staff Congress of CUNY, all of whom, you know, all, all of these organizations fighting for divestment. Uh, we're presently in the struggle to push Tom DiNapoli, who is the controller of the state uh, uh, of New York and is the sole um, uh, decision maker on uh, the uh, pension funds in New York State and is absolutely resistant to divestment, and I hope that everyone here will put on your list, uh, your to-do list tomorrow to look up Tom DiNapoli's phone number and email and let him know that you are determined that he will divest from fossil fuel funds, because that's the kind of pressure we need. And also, those of you who live in New York State, to push your state 
uh, assembly members and senators to support the divestment resolution that we have in, in the New York State Legislature. Advice, please. How do we move this campaign forward? Thank you. And it, this has been a great panel. Thank you. Just keep, keep hammering. I mean, we had a quick conversation in the elevator um, with Scott, but you know, he, he didn't, as he admitted, he didn't initially want to do this either. And so, and I think continuing to do all the things that you're doing, and the case is only getting stronger, and I think what I like about this panel is it's all the different avenues. So I think just remembering to make all the different arguments that you can, but ultimately, um, we know that the pressure works, and I bet there's a lot of people in this room who are also regularly calling Tom DiNapoli, but show of hands of who's already made those calls and is willing to do more. Maybe, we, could we get double the hands? Double the commitments? Okay, a few more hands. Okay, great. We just got a few, a few, a few dozen more calls in, so we'll, we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> well, um, was it last year they announced this uh, decarbonization advisory board which has come out and I know that they are doing some work on trying to do the analytics around it, how to do the framing and, and understanding of it. Um, but to, to echo what you said, um, maybe draw a little movie uh, an analogy in here. I, I saw Shawshank with Dempsey the other day, I don't know if you probably have seen it and you know he, he wanted a library and he wrote a letter every week and then he did that for a couple of years and after then suddenly he got a reply and then what was the answer? It's not to stop, but he said two letters a week. So I think maybe that's part of the pressure is really keep it on. And when you start to see something happening, uh, what they have already done is uh, start to frame, to start to understand, start to get off. You, you know, divestment from coal is fairly uh, logical. I think uh, that has been mentioned many times here, but the rest of the portfolio is um, maybe a little bit more tricky sometimes, but keep the pressure on them. I think that's probably the best um, the best advice to, to, to look at. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm Laura, the consultant. So I have a question for the carbon tracker uh, representative. Uh, so now currently this uh, wood pellets like considered to be of biomass and they have like green certificates for that. It's not like carbon from that is not calculated. Are you considering this and are you trying to, do you have any attempts to change the system that this wooden, burning this wood from the USA in the UK uh, is considered to be carbon or like this is one first question and second one uh, actually in history we have that in environmental policy we have that experience that uh, developed countries uh, say okay we will uh, impose carbon tax and then for example in Scandinavia they have uh, raised their taxes uh, on, on uh, pollutants and then these companies moved to China and India where they have uh, weak environmental legislation so if we look globally the pollution didn't change I mean in Scandinavia maybe it became like clean they are living in a clean environment but in China in India like it, the pollution has increased so uh, how it's going to be done in this case and also um, I'm surprised that uh, in Canada, in the USA, uh, government subsidizes oil and gas companies because in Kazakhstan, uh, it's, uh, this is the oil companies that pay most of the taxes to the government. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, if we phase out from uh, fossil fuels, let's say, uh, how uh, these countries are going to earn money to, to feed their people, uh, to, to feed their people, and th there will be any subsidies to these developing countries that are highly dependent on oil and gas uh, resources. Yeah. I think when we are okay. thinking about these ideas, we should think globally, not right. like about what, USA. What I'd like to do, you, yeah. you have a very big question. So yeah. what I'd like to do is, if you have a few minutes afterwards, I'd like to talk to you about it. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank well, you. Um, one more, um, and if we can keep the question short and to the point and the answers, because that's the last question. Do you want to arm wrestle for who goes for the last question? Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, we're, we're scientists, um, we're concerned because we actually worked in a technology that uh, can make explosive energy from water. I wondered if any of you track brilliant light power. Uh, we're obviously concerned because this is something that's tracked by the CIA 
uh, we have the top physicists in the Navy on our team. Just wanted to know if you know about hydrogen energy, if it's in your models, or if you even know anything about this. Anybody? No, Brilliant Light Power Sorry. Company, uh, 493 Old Trenton Road, New Jersey. Okay. Anyone know about it? Okay, so just to make you aware, that's something I, I hope you track, uh, and it's something that's strategic importance to uh, my company's end of petroleum. That we're basically scientists, very concerned, and obviously promoting this idea that there's a primary new energy source in nature. So anyway, just to just you sure. reach out to me. Why don't we yeah. talk okay. after the panel? Yeah. Uh, the, with the, we have to close out this panel. I have one thing we didn't talk about, which is quickly, um, it's the financial risk that we've all sort of alluded to and that Elliot spelled out uh, brilliantly. Uh, University of California divested last week. They had a one sentence reason why. They said, we treat fossil fuel stocks the way we treat every other stock. When they no longer are a value proposition, we sell them. Thanks to Tom and thanks to our wonderful panel. It is the end of a long day, at the end of a long week. I, when I walked into the church tonight, I started yawning, and the reason was because when I was in my 20s and lived in New York, this was my church, and I started the homeless shelter in the basement, and I came every night, month after month, right about this time to uh, put everybody to bed and go to sleep myself. So I just, it was a, 30 years later, it was a kind of autonomic reaction. But <laughs> then I started hearing what people were saying and I woke right up. This is an amazing moment. Uh, uh, look, when Tom talked about the University of California divesting last week, eight, $80 billion, I remember the night when we got the very first divestment commitment there was. It was Unity College in Maine and it was $8 million, so that is four orders of magnitude greater now. Thanks to the people in this room, this has become one of the two or three great fronts in this incredible war to try and save the planet. It, people, the talent and the skill that people have brought to bear here is just almost beyond belief. And now we take it to the next level. Some of you may have seen the piece I wrote in the New Yorker last week about <laughs> banks and insurance companies. There's already people hard at work on this. We've caused a lot more trouble for Exxon than they ever thought we could. We're going to cause just as much trouble for Chase and City and everybody else. This is the next front. But I have a special announcement tonight to reward you guys for having stayed alert and awake and here, okay? We've divested, seen people divest from all kinds of organizations on this planet, okay? From churches, from universities, from sovereign wealth funds, from pension funds, on down the list. But I tell you one thing you have not yet seen is a major American utility company announced that they were divesting their pension fund from fossil fuel. I want to bring forward an old friend of mine, Mary Powell, the CEO of Green Mountain Power, which provides power for all of the state of Vermont, or most of the state of Vermont. I wrote an article for The New Yorker a few years ago on utilities, and I interviewed a lot of utility executives, and I have to say, I was not overly, I said, I think, at one point to someone that you could count the number of enlightened utility executives in America on the fingers of one finger. And <laughs> That finger was Mary Powell, who I bring to you now for an announcement that we are going to spread around the country and around the world tomorrow. This is one of those moments, like the night when the Rockefellers announced they were divesting, that really show precisely what kind of work you all have done. So thank you so much. And Bill, thank you so much. I was, I was listening to all of these amazing, intelligent people speaking tonight, and I was thinking, you know, we need, we do need, we need opposition, we need agitators, but you know what? We also need people who inspire us. And Bill McKibben 
You have been inspiring me for over 20 years, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, it is, with, it is with incredible pleasure that I stand before you tonight to say that Green Mountain Power, the, we don't think of ourselves as a utility, by the way, we think of ourselves as an energy transformation company. We are a company that is committed to helping the Vermonters we serve get off of fossil fuels. We serve them now with a portfolio that is 90% carbon free, 63% renewable, and we have already made a commitment to be 100% renewable by 2030, 20 years ahead of the state goal. Um, so it is only logical that we should also be divesting in our pension funds. And so we're announcing tonight with Bill, Climate Week in New York City, that we are going to be 99.2% divested by the end of this week. So, <laughs> so I, I also, as I was listening to people tonight, I was thinking of one of my other great inspirations I take, and it's from Yoda in Star Wars. <laughs> You know, and it's that line, do or do not, there is no try. So um, we are doing it, we are divesting, we will be 100% divested by the end of next year, but as I said, by 99.2%, uh, by tomorrow we will be divested. And um, again, you know, the planet is on fire. And the work that we're doing um, is the same work that you're doing. It could never be more important than it is. And while I take hope in some of the things I've heard, um, honestly, emissions are still going up. Even in the green little state of Vermont, emissions are still going up. So we have a lot of work to do in accelerating this consumer-led revolution. The technologies exist. Let's do it. I'm so excited to be with all of you tonight, especially you, Bill McKibben. So thank you. Fantastic. So we have two other announcements, uh, with Vanessa and Elisa, if you could both make your way up. And, and Malik, start to make your way up to the front so that we can have you right on and make the most of the short time we've got left. Vanessa Warheit from Fossil Free California and Elisa Lee, Director of Divest Ed with the Better Future Project are oh, each going to share an announcement. Hi everyone, it's 9.30 but I'm so energized. I'm so excited to follow Bill who was such a big part of inspiring me. My name is Alisa and I have been working on divestment for the last quarter of my life for seven years ever since I was a student at UCLA and it took me a full week uh, on Sunday for the emotional impact of the win that we got to actually hit that our campaign actually won and won such a big thing for the movement. Um, my goal is to represent the passion, the power, and the plans of the thousands of students across this country who are taking powerful action every day to get their schools to divest. And even just today, fi over 1,500 students at Yale walked out as part of Climate Strike Week of Action to protest. Yale's investments in not only fossil fuels, but debt holdings in Puerto Rico and what they're calling disaster debt. And I just, um, I'm really privileged to represent all of those students with our work in Divest Ed, supporting student divestment campaigns across the country. And I'll just say that we are upping the ante in 2020. Students have come to us and are like, we are ready to organize and re invigorate our movement and show how big and powerful we are. So February 13th, 2020, we are planning a national fossil fuel divestment day of action called F2D2. So please follow us. You can find out more about it at our website, divested.org. And we are, that is just the first step to even bigger escalations we are planning in fall 2020. We're hoping to make action sustained. Um, hope we're not sure exactly what it'll look like, but we're thinking something like occupations of all across the country, campuses all across the country sustained throughout the fall, and students are ready. The divest movement is not dead. It is so alive. Every, every incoming student that I've been talking to, they're applying for internships with us. They already have their resumes full of climate uh, organizing experience and, you know, 
first year students who are still going to be around for four more years, they are so ready to dedicate their lives to this. So you are at a great place, great time to be a divestment sort of partner and organizer. And I'm just very, very glad um, to have everyone's support here. Um, Divest.org, please follow us and please keep supporting students who have bravely been leading this movement since the beginning. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for sticking around so late. Um, my name is Vanessa Warhide. I'm the Executive Director of Fossil Free California, and we have a little announcement. We've been um, stalwartly uh, insisting, uh, politely, although with ever uh, more vehemence, that both of our two major pension funds need to divest from fossil fuels. California is home to the two largest pension funds in the country, CalSTRS and CalPERS, which represent the state teachers and the state public employees. Together, those two pension funds have over $600 billion in assets under management. They are the gorillas in the room. And, um, you know, everybody says, well, like, but really, I mean, how bad is it, you know? And, and we've heard tonight, well, actually, it's kind of bad. You're actually now losing money. And, and people keep saying, well, how much? So I'm here to tell you tonight we have preliminary results on how much money they've lost at PERS by not divesting. Um, and I was hesitant to get up here earlier when Fletcher called me because I literally just got the numbers like uh, 10 minutes before I got here. So the preliminary, and I wanna say these are preliminary, but the preliminary results of the PERS fund analysis are that based on analysis of public security filings, if CalPERS had divested from fossil fuels 10 years ago, and those funds had simply been reinvested proportionally across the other sectors, the rest of the portfolio, portfolio. every current member, active or retired, all 1.9 million of them would each be somewhere between five and $13,000 richer. That's my mom. My mom is a, she's actually a PERS and a STRS employee. We'd have an extra five to $13,000 and that's, you know, almost two million of those, um, Household, those households in the state. Um, and the reason that there's such a vast discrepancy is that it depends on the kind of screening that you do. So just a note that divestment comes in all flavors and sometimes some kinds of divestment are more or less profitable than others. So the total amount is over $20 billion that they left sitting on the table by not taking our polite advice. And we're not being so polite anymore, and we're actually partnering with the youth, and we've been occupying the STRS offices every two months. We're gonna be there again next week. So follow us, thank you so much. So as we, as we close, um, it is a beyond privilege to invite Malik Youssef, the wordsmith, uh, to join, the, to come up onto the stage. Malik is a remarkable, avant-garde spoken word poet. Um, he's nationally and internationally known and speaks to national and international issues. Born in Chicago, um, rose from the South Side, 24-time Grammy nominee. Six-time Grammy winner, seven-time ASCAP award winner for both pop and R&B, and the the credits and the accolades go on and on. So come on up and, and share with us. Hey, y'all. Thank y'all for staying around. Um, thank y'all for being here this entire week. Thank you for the work that you're doing in your respective, respective uh, communities and the global community as well. My name is Malik Youssef. The wordsmith, I'm a producer and a songwriter, and above all those things, I'm an environmentalist. And um, I just want to give you a little bit of information and some encouragement today. There's an uh, old story I learned when I was a kid called Stone Soup. Familiar with this song? We have to put those practices into play. As it is customary, when there's a war happening, we celebrate the soldiers before they leave our homes. We pray for them, we hug them, we kiss them, we feed them. They go off to war, 
we'd rather not pay attention to the atrocities in that war, because there's casualties. Everyone in here is a climate warrior. We're stopping pipelines. This is big business shit. This is not little kid shit. We on some real serious, very powerful magic. Our medicine is powerful. What we have to do is apply the methods of the warriors from Stone Soup. They knew that upon their return would not be as much revelry, would not be much acceptance. There would be traumas they were dealing with that people would rather not open their eyes and ears to. So as they walked back to their homes through several villages, the people were accustomed to having people beat on their door, ask for food, demand food, say, I fought for you, I'm fighting for you. This is for you. People are like, well, I got kids and a dog and a sick cat. And my daughter wants a canary that the sick cat might eat. I don't want to hear about what happened to you in the war. I don't want to hear about how you beat back the, the hordes of deadly everything. I don't want to hear it. So what they decided to do was come through the village quietly, laughing and talking to each other and go to the center of the village and start a small fire. Get the, they get the kettle and say, put this on the fire. And they say, let's fill this with some sweet water. This well has sweet water. And as they were doing these seemingly trivial tasks, they were storytelling. They were talking to each other. And they were remembering it fondly of how bravely they fought. And people started to pay attention and they tasted the soup that was just water and fire. And they said, it could use some salt, maybe a bit of salt. I wonder, does anybody have some salt? The neighbor closest said, I, I can spare salt. I thought you wanted me to feed you. I thought you wanted me to listen to your gripes and your moans, but I got some salt. He bought some salt and they put the salt and they stirred it. They said, hey neighbor, taste it now. He said, yeah, it tastes good, but maybe some pepper said, my neighbor has pepper, bring him out. He bought pepper. The next person said, what's, what's missing? This salt and pepper, what's missing? They said, maybe a little oregano. Somebody bought oregano. Then somebody bought thyme. Somebody bought basil. Somebody bought celery, then onions, then garlic, then potatoes. You don't have to do this by yourself. Tell your story. You don't have to beat people in the face. Tell your story. They will come to it. You're not tired. You think you're tired. You think you're worn out. It's a big fight. No. You're under-resourced because you're not being resourceful. Your neighbor is a climate warrior waiting to happen. The planet is on fire. They're not fired up because you're not lighting the fire in the center of the village. You're not lighting the fire in the center. I know that every tear is an ingredient. Every disappointment, every refusal letter, every time somebody doesn't write you a check, that's an ingredient in this star soup. The world, the world can be changed and fed through everybody collectively bringing just a little bit. You don't have to do it by yourself. I'm gonna say that one more time. You don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to sacrifice your children, your grandparents, your in-laws, and whoever. You don't have to sacrifice them. They can be part of this with you. Tell the story. Tell it sweetly. This planet is our mother. This is our mother, but some people don't see it that way. Because they've been indoctrinated with falsehoods, you understand? And it's easier not to look in the face of a warrior that's outside camping and being bitten by mosquitoes and braving crocodiles. I stood out on Wall Street in below freezing weather when we first started Divest Invest. I was deadly ill. I don't get sick often. That day I was sick, I was tired, I was cold, but stone soup. One person came out and said, hey, what's what you guys doing out here? Now the Wall Street guys, they knew what was happening, but the business that support Wall Street, the coffee shops, the sandwich shops, we turned them into, client, into climate justice warriors. You understand me? This is your job. It's not, you don't have to pick up the whole thing by yourself. Everybody can add a finger 
What did, what did Bill say? Fingers on the smallest finger. Think that micro. Think in the, the macro is too big for us. The earth is some sectarian tons. But in a small doses, we are powerful. Salt, pepper, oregano, rosemary, thyme. Thank y'all so much. Appreciate you. A blessing.